Okay, so good morning everyone. I hope you can all hear me. I, I hope I speak loud enough. Um, so today I'd like to discuss uh, the future of front-end development. Um, and uh, as I already mentioned, I've been working on different projects. So basically what I'm going to try to do is do an experience report with the technologies I already worked with and try to see you know, to what conclusions I came uh, to by using these technologies. Just to start off, um, maybe a quick disclaimer, right? So this is um, my opinion. I'm going <coughs> to say what I learned, what I experienced um, using these technologies. And obviously, that's maybe not the truth. I hope it is. But, um, <coughs> but you still should use the things I say to uh, reflect and to uh, evaluate the technologies, having that in mind, but still come to your own uh, decision in the end, right? So to get started. Um, we have this, right? Um, and this is the internet. <laughs> um, so according to some survey, uh, uh, here 94% um, of all internet sites now use JavaScript, right? Um, and so you can't, I mean, there are some sites that if you open them with JavaScript disabled, you just can have a blank page, right? So it's not only that JavaScript now enhances the websites, but their whole websites are built entirely on JavaScript, right? So they call these single page applications. Um, and they, they're just uh, showing up everywhere, right? <laughs> so this brings us to JavaScript. So first question, who in the room writes JavaScript code regularly? Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Um, so it's very popular, so uh, my idea was that I would introduce each technology with a short code example and explain so that you kind of get a feeling um, what, what, what it looks like and what it feels like. But for JavaScript, I thought that's boring. You all know JavaScript, so maybe we should just do a little quiz um, on JavaScript, right? So just, just a short quiz. So here's this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so we all write JavaScript uh, frequently, so we all know the answers, right? So, so what, do you, what, what would you say? Good first one. True or false? Who's for true? Uh, who, who's for false? Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> right, so not a number is not not a number. Um, so now we have this strict equality in JavaScript. So here we, we really make, we, 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 we verify the type, we don't do any casting. So do you think this is true? Or is it false? Yeah, sorry, it's false too. <laughs> but then there's this common name that says, is not a number. And is not a number not a number? Is this true? Yeah, yeah this is true, right? So you already know it. <coughs> Okay, so um, this is a cool picture, um, right? Uh, this is JavaScript. Uh, there's some good parts, obviously. Um, so I'm not going to go into details here. Just a little side note: there's a website, and you can paste in any JavaScript, and it will convert into a JavaScript that only uses six characters, and it does the same thing, right? So you can do that. And uh, well, the people or JavaScript's improving, right? So with the new standard, they're improving stuff like they're introducing stuff like block scoping, like constants, uh, lexical this and class and all. So JavaScript's uh, JavaScript's really uh, moving on and advancing. And uh, if you look at the development, also a lot of um, frameworks are popping up to make JavaScript development easy, right? We, we started out with JavaScript uh, with jQuery for simple enhancement, right? You add uh, some click handler. To your, to your website that when you click a button it disables itself or it, it turns blue. Uh, or you had new tools and then you had backbone jazz and all these uh, 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 these libraries that only were meant to enhance um, existing JavaScript development experience. And now uh, these frameworks uh, uh, that are recently, uh, or not recently, but they're, they're getting more and more popular, are more of a full stack front end solution, right? So, this uh, React uh, or Vue or AngularJS, they are kind of like an idea how to implement um, the whole application, not just a, a, a single responsibility like clicking on a button. <laughs> and they come with tooling, right? So they, they, make, they make things easier, they make debugging easier, they, they, make, they have editor support, um, and they provide third-party widget components, right? So if you have, if you decide to structure your application with React, for example, then you can find lots of uh, widgets you can introduce, like uh, calendars, uh, etc. So there's a rich ecosystem developing here. And one thing a lot of these, these frameworks propose is patterns, right? So you don't have to come up yourself, how should I actually structure my application? No, 
Now, on all of these uh, websites, you have uh, some description that tells you if you use uh, React.js, please or strict, think strongly about structuring your application in this way, right? In this in this manner. So, for example, for <coughs> For uh, React, um, I think a lot of people have already seen this, is the, the flux pattern that they proposed um, that kind of like uh, suggests a unidirectional data flow, right? So you have actions uh, coming from a server, for example, going into this dispatcher, and then this dispatcher will then dispatch uh, the actions to a store. In the store, you have the state of the application that you update according to the actions you receive. Then you have the view that actually you know, renders the, the, the state, uh, the, the, the state. And in the view, if somebody clicks there, then you can send out a new action to the dispatcher and uh, compute again uh, the new state, right? And this goes on and on and on. So you have a very clear uh, data flow and uh, a, very, a very good separation of concerns. And this is great, right? I mean, this looks cool, and if you're coming from a functional programming background, uh, I'll show on the next slide, you think of this, oh, this is a pure function, great, cool, and, and, and you're happy. But then, if you have JavaScript, who prevents you from sidestepping this architecture, right? Why, why? You can also have a callback into the store here and just call the store and update something. Or maybe you, in your state you have a mutable object that you can just modify and nobody will prevent you from doing this, right? Maybe you have great colleagues that do code reviews and that will hit you if you do that. Um, but I think uh, this, we all know that still there, we, if we, we can, if you do something quickly then maybe uh, we still sidestep somehow. And sidestepping these patterns, I think, is very bad because it introduces bugs that nobody expects, right? If you come up with your own architecture, then you know what, maybe where to look. But if your colleagues and everybody in your team thinks you're using this pattern, then they don't really look in other places. And then these, if you sidestep the pattern, you're introducing bugs that are very, very difficult to find. <laughs> um, so here's just what I said before, right? So this is um, maybe a written down a more functional notation, you have this, you have a, a function that applies action to the state, you get a new state, and then you can render the view from state, you get some HTML, and inside you can dispatch new actions, right? Um, and then here you, you see, if the state would be mutable, if I could change the state inside render view, then I could easily, accidentally even, um, sidestep this whole architecture. So, um, what, what not happens now is, well, how can we solve this in JavaScript, right? In JavaScript, everything's mutable by default. So we can do whatever we want. <coughs> so the first <coughs> solution that comes to mind is using <coughs> JavaScript's naked object dot freeze, right? You can freeze an object and you get runtime exceptions. Or there's uh, libraries coming up like immutable.js, where you have immutable, actually immutable collections for JavaScript that you can use. Um, there are, are libraries that encourage functional programming style with combinators uh, for your use. And um, there's also libraries that uh, offer a complete solution for this reactive uh, wiring, right? But still, this is all just some help to patch some things up, but there's no enforcement, right? And so we're late, and we all developers know it, we're all lazy, right? We want to go for the, the past of the least resistance, so uh, we need some kind of enforcement here, I would say, right? <laughs> So then, the next step is, hmm, maybe uh, let's try linters, right? Linters can find a lot of stuff uh, these days. They can catch common coding errors like uh, calling something that's not defined. Um, they can disallow some patterns, but the problem is that uh, there are multiple problems with linters. One, uh, you all expect them to be really, really quick because you want to uh, run them all the time. And the other problem is that as JavaScript is a very dynamic language, right, the analysis is sometimes pretty difficult if you write your code in a certain way. So, um, and you don't get any uh, checking of that your, what you have there is actually, a, you don't have any sort of high checking, right? And um, one thing that, uh, that came up was that somebody wrote very strict linter rules that prevent you from muting, uh, mutating objects. So you can get pretty far with this, but still it's not uh, the optimal solution. <laughs> so we move on. What what we do next, how can we make some assertions about the structure of a program? And this essentially brings us to type checkers for JavaScript, right? And there are multiple, well, there are actually three type checkers for JavaScript that I would say are uh, pretty popular, right? So there's the Clojure compiler uh, from Google. And actually at TechPad we used this two or three years ago, I'll talk about this later, on a code base of 30,000 lines of code. 
And the problem is that uh, you have to unattach your types in the, in, the, in the comments. And the type checking at the time, maybe it's better now, but at the time it was very weak and it had, didn't have many features. So we mainly use Haskell in our backend. And if you come from Haskell and then you have this weak type checker, you kind of, you know, you rely on it because you think, oh, I can just change this code. It will, the type checker will find the mistake anyway, and it just doesn't, right? So um, that's a very, that was a problem for us. And the other thing that was a problem for us that is really, really slow, right? So if you uh, compile something, you, you, will, you will have to wait as long as you wait in Haskell uh, for it to compile. Not as long, but, uh, and that's not very good for content integration, right? So you get, uh, you, you see um, where this is going. Um, but what's very nice about the Google Composer compiler is that it has some source code compression and unification or very good uh, built in, so you get very, very small JavaScript and optimized. So that's great. Um, then there's Facebook Flow. So uh, as I said, um, in this talk I'll try to talk about things that are actually used in, in production code and I haven't done this with Facebook Flow. We evaluate it because we want to move away from the Google Flow compiler. Um, but uh, we just, it was very, very, very young and unstable and was like, like maybe three weeks after the first release. The ecosystem was, was annotation was not good um, and so we, we didn't go for it, right? Um, but it has a good React, uh, React.js integration and it only requires a small uh, translation set. Right? And at the end, uh, it's, it's TypeScript, right, from Microsoft. And this is what we picked, so I can uh, offer an in-depth look at, at, at TypeScript. Right, <laughs> so as I started off, uh, as I said earlier, I'll introduce all the technologies with a small code example. So here's just a, a, a small uh, TypeScript uh, snippet. So basically, uh, it's a superset of JavaScript, right? Um, and they really try to follow closely the, the, the newest JavaScript specifications that come to that up here. And it, it, it uh, also adds uh, this type uh, type signatures and type checking on top, right? So you see here in the constructor, the greeting has an annotation of string, and then the compiler will enforce that we can only pass in strings at this, like, at this point. It also does a little bit of type inference, but it's not always great, so be prepared to, to write type signatures. And this type check uh, system is actually really growing uh, fast and in a, in a good sense, and they're integrating lots of features that you are used from Haskell. Um, um, so uh, it's, it's growing in a great direction. <coughs> so TypeScript, um, basically JavaScript with uh, the type system, and I'd say it's syntactic sugar, um, it's a state developed by Microsoft, so they're really, really making frequent releasing. It's moving the project. You can see that there's a lot of, uh, but there's, there's really movement there, right? And the learning curve is really small. You know, if you know JavaScript, then maybe you have to get used that uh, the compiler will hit you if you, do, if you mess up with the types. But otherwise, um, uh, you can really adopt it very fast. And um, there are many prominent adopters already, right? So AngularJS team wrote uh, Angular 2, I think, completely in TypeScript. This guy, this Ubisoft, and we uh, use TypeScript too, right? And the cool thing about TypeScript is also that it has a, uh, you can use all the, uh, the libraries that already exist for JavaScript, right? Um, and some of them, or many of them, already have a type definition file which also tells you uh, what type signatures the functions inside these JavaScript libraries actually have. Of course, you have to kind of trust that they match, uh, but in the end, this works, in practice, this works quite well. Um, and so, I'm just going to uh, show you a quick screenshot. This is our, our checkpad application, our mobile um, health record on the iPad. And we run a lot of JavaScript on here, actually. So this is this, this uh, uh, iOS client is basically a, spe a specialized browser, right? So we generate the UI on the server. And then uh, we kind of just like render an HTTP on the client. And to get these interactions, we uh, have to, uh, a JavaScript engine running that can actually dynamically change and, and interact with somebody who is on plants. And as I said earlier, we started out with JavaScript. We were fed up with it. We went over to Closure Compiler. We still weren't very happy, and so we moved uh, to TypeScript. And so we converted uh, from plain JavaScript with this Closure uh, integration in actually in two weeks. So it wasn't that painful. There was one person converting the code, and of course, we, we didn't uh, make everything perfectly typeset uh, in, in, in the first step because that would be too much work. There's this nice little loophole in TypeScript that you can uh, have a type any, right? And if you say that something is a type any, it can be anything. And we use this in some places that now hit us, okay? But, um, <laughs> so this is great. And the reason why I still think this is a good idea is 
because you can then incrementally move over to Python, right? Because otherwise, if you say, let's change technologies today, then people will say, no, 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 we don't want to invest four months of non-productivity. And this is, I would say this is not the case with time, right? And you can get going pretty quickly again. Now we have like 55,000 lines of code. We're generally really happy with the results, right? Um, and as, uh, as um, they introduce new features to the type checker in, in TypeScript, uh, they find more edge cases in our software where we think, ah, yeah, right, this is uh, something we didn't handle yet. Um, so this is, this is really great. Um, but one thing we don't like so much is that, uh, as I said earlier, with anything you can kind of get an incremental advancement, but the new features that they do, you can either turn on or off. So if they introduce a new check and you want it, and you turn it on and your whole code base blows up, then basically you can turn it on. You have to refactor everything to match to this first, and then you can turn it on. So uh, as they now introduce something called strict null checking, where we actually check that a value is not just of a type string or null, but you have to actually specify if it's null or not. But in our case, we obviously don't didn't annotate our code well enough, and we have a problem here, and we, it will take some effort to, to fix. So you can't, at this point, for the more sophisticated checking features, you can't really make it right? <laughs> so I'm just going to show one uh, small uh, feature of the type uh, script checker. This is this no interest this checking, because I think everybody already heard, uh, or everybody has this pain, right? So here's just a, a small click handler uh, that I wrote in plain JavaScript. Um, not to worry about what these clear shopping cart, fi fi uh, field shopping cart functions do, but I implemented this handle click function here that will, when called, clear the shopping cart, then set a timeout, and then fill in an apple in the shopping cart after whatever, 20 milliseconds. And if I run this, I get uh, a runtime error undefined in the function uh, right here. Right? So why is that? Well, well uh, it, it turns out that the, uh, the, the, the caller of functions can manipulate what this, this actually means. Right? So we kind of need to keep track <coughs> of the list, and the type of the list, so when we when we um, when we translate this to, to, to pure script and we turn on this no implicit this, then we get some type errors here that this, like the compiler doesn't know what the type of this this is, is right. <laughs> so what you have to do is in this case you have to annotate what the this should be inside of this function, and then when you try to call it um, and you don't and the this will change right. So document on click will change the this. To the element that was clicked, then you get a type error, right? So this is just one example where you, and this is a very common, frequent problem in JavaScript. A lot of bugs appear to this, and this is really nicely solved in TypeScript now, right? So just one example of how this can uh, improve uh, your code. <coughs> right, and this is then, uh, yeah, this is why I told earlier, so right, you get a type error. So concluding uh, to, to concluding to TypeScript, it's really a major compiler, right? Uh, the, 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 the language is stable. Um, the, 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 the development is steady. You have a great ecosystem. The tooling is very, very good, right? They have this Visual Studio Code editor that is developed by Microsoft, and it integrates really well. The compiler is fast. You get a good type system. It improves, and it can it actually catches many, 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 many JavaScript errors that are very common. And now on the, uh, on the con side, I'd say, well, that the flags are all or nothing. That's maybe not optimal for migrating large code bases to new features. And then that you don't have any mutability. That's still something that when we started out with the patterns, if you remember, we, we want, but we don't get here. Or we only get via libraries, but not enforced anywhere. And we also have no side effect control. So we have no guarantees that our view function will manipulate our, uh, and, uh, our, our state or do uh, call some some Mayas or whatever, right? So how can we uh, now tackle no immutability and no side effect control? Now, uh, a new player appeared, <laughs> Elm, uh, also a very uh, young uh, programming languages, and uh, it looks like this. So basically, it looks a little bit uh, like Haskell. You, you define a function for your view. So the view function takes a model and a description how to render this view, right? So we have some div, a button that can be clicked, that sends when clicked a decrement action. 
Um, then it shows the model as a string, and we have an increment action when we clicked on the this button, right? And these are the actions that are here called messages. And then you have a, an update function that takes a message and a model and produces a new model. So this is very clean and well structured, uh, and, and this fits a, a pattern very well. And, and this is, uh, Elm has strong type checking, right? And no side effects, and this will enforce this pattern. So it's very, as you can see here, I use this beginner programming combinator that actually enforces this structure. So you can't really go around this, this pattern that, that they present here. So here's just uh, the idea again for, uh, as a schema, right? So you have a model that gets shown by a view that can send actions to an update function that can perform controlled side effects, <laughs> like download data from a server, and then transform the model and then we, we uh, render this, uh, this thing again, right? <laughs> and so this is pretty similar to the, this flux pattern. Now, unfortunately, um, and I'll come to that in a minute, they, they, they changed this a little bit, um, but that's the idea is good and it's enforced, right? So there's no way to sidestep this. So Elm is like an ML Haskell uh, language. It's a simpler type system than Haskell, right? And, and it's smaller synt and smaller syntax. Um, and it's pure, it has a strong type system, and the goal is to, to joyfully and bug-free uh, write uh, front-end applications, right? And it should be easy to learn. And this is, I think, personally, is what they really uh, achieved, right? So Elm uh, is a Haskell, or I'd say uh, an exotic language that is not uh, known uh, everywhere, not many people use yet, but it's very easy to learn now. Because they, they have a simple type system and small syntax, they can generate, generate very, very nice error messages that actually tell you what, what went wrong, right? Because in other cases, you get a, a long uh, a type error and you don't really know where to look. <laughs> and now, unfortunately, the, the development is a little bit slower than, or a lot slower than in TypeScript, and it's mainly one, mainly the creator of the language uh, working on it, on the, on the core compiler, of course, in the ecosystem, there are more people working <coughs> on it. They have about 400 packages. But, uh, 4,000, uh, 400 packages, yeah, but the problem here I see is that they uh, don't <coughs> really encourage wrapping existing JavaScript code. So they want to have everything implemented in N because, you know, JavaScript's bad and proofs bugs. So we, we don't want, we don't want that. You can do it, it's not do documented, and, but it works, right? So you can do it, but it's, you, you, for example, you can't publish packages on their package render without being on a whitelist. Um, that, uh, that integrate with JavaScript. <clears throat> but it's still, there, are, there is some commercial adoption that no red ink, that's more, probably the most popular um, uh, 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 commercial user. They actually hired uh, uh, Evan for working on the compiler, and then there's Freezy, Circuit Hub. Um, I uh, did two projects uh, with Elm, or, or, or some parts of project with Elm, too. <laughs> and this brings me uh, to Trackload, right? So just a small uh, thing what we do. We push measurement devices on top of uh, uh, train tracks, do some uh, beam and laser beam on them, then we do some data crunching, and, and at the end we show a nice maps and, and analysis of what's, what's broken and what needs to be fixed. Um, and we generate nice reports like, like this, right? So here you have uh, some intersection uh, and here's all as well, so that's why I'm showing you this, otherwise I wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> um, and you can see the, the train tracks and so this view, for example, um, what you see here, this is uh, entirely written in Elm. So um, here's another view that uh, also has some tabular view. It's also written entirely in Elm. And um, the, the reason is we also started out with JavaScript. We weren't too happy. And um, the, the cool thing is that we developed our, our front end very modular, right? So each uh, view that you have is basically an individual app, right? So if you have uh, the map view, that's completely decoupled uh, from, from, for example, this detailed view, right? So of course, if they are written in the same language, then they can share code via libraries, but they don't have to. <laughs> and of course, uh, we are a startup, so the, the initial thing was hacked together quite, quite quickly, and we were looking for something that where you could still have a good development speed, but you have a little bit of a safety net that not everything breaks when you try to change everything. So in, in August 2050, I, I, I decided, uh, why not try out Elm? You know, uh, it's, it looks looks quite cool. And and actually, I had a bug that where I sidestepped the pattern, the flux pattern, and it was really I got really mad. So I, I thought maybe something that enforces the patterns, it's good, it's good, like for my own discipline, right? And so we started with one component, and the initial development was really fun and quick. I mean, it was just it, 
went, went, went somewhere, right, you could see results, and uh, it, it was cheerful. And uh, coming from Haskell, sometimes I was like, the, the ways to, to abstract are a little bit more limited, right? Because the type system is less sophisticated, and you end up writing some boilerplate for OTS. And what I also kind of like didn't like that much is that it, it, it's similar a little bit to Haskell, but you can't really share any code base from Haskell or even from the existing JavaScript thing, because this is discouraged and uh, you have to go through some backdoors. <laughs> so that was things that I, I didn't uh, really feel too great about. <laughs> and so the story goes on, uh, uh, and uh, customers uh, came into the, into the uh, started using our, our application. And so we went into the office, and uh, the first the customer that saw this had I I a uh, Explorer nine. So uh, we were all excited to show uh, our new cool feature, and he opened it in our browser, and uh, bam, white page. Uh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good, right? Um, um, uh, luckily, uh, we could fix this uh, pretty easily, so we just opened the debug console. We saw that some request animation frame thing that Elm on parallel uses didn't exist in Linux 9. You had to fully fill it, and, and, and all went well. So the good thing is here you can really, uh, the, the code generated here by Elm is, is so that you can actually still try to find problems quite easily. Um, then a new version of Elm came out, Elm 1016, uh, right? And we, uh, we only had 5,000 lines, but we needed to change 800 lines to just to adopt to this new Elm version. Because they did syntactical changes, and they changed uh, other things, right? So of course, the language still has the zero here in this versioning, so maybe this, uh, this is, you should expect this. And I think you still need to expect this. Um, but yeah, so moving on to the next version was quite a big, or not a big step, but you can see, I mean, we almost changed a fifth of the line for code. And then uh, what, what came up next was a customer feature request. And all this rendering of, uh, you saw earlier was used, was rendered using a core, so like from the prelude, the standard library, library graphics API, right? And they now removed it in the, uh, in the, the most recent release. So all the code relied on, a, on an API that is now removed and deprecated. And this is a, kind of like a closed ecosystem, this graphic library, so it was actually impossible to implement the, the customer feature request, not even with Hacky FFI. You would have had to fork the core library and change some things to actually achieve what we wanted. And this was actually pretty bad. So I was, that, that, that's where I was like this, right? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, now, now uh, Elm 0.17 came out and they changed the core pattern of the architecture. So they said, oh, what we proposed there was not all wrong, but we have to change this in some way. And they also did significantly uh, change the language and the core library again. And I uh, don't, didn't want to uh, keep up with this uh, here at this point. <laughs> right, so uh, the, the conclusion here is that Elm is really easy to learn. So even even if you're coming um, from, from JavaScript or not, and haven't done functional drawing before before, it's really fun. Um, and the, the tooling is, is, is actually quite good. So if you have Atom or Emacs, the plugins, they, they show inline type errors, they show linting errors, they can uh, uh, refactor your imports. Um, so it's, it's great, right? It offers immutability and side effect control. So we kind of like solved many of the problems we had earlier. And uh, the con. I would say is that the ecosystem is still, and the language are still, so I have frequent, frequent breaking changes, right? So uh, you just you have to know this. I mean, maybe this is not a not a no argument for you because if you if you if you're happy with, with dealing with that, then that's okay. And I think the integration with existing JavaScript, but that, 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 that this is this fresh, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, but this is just my opinion, and there are people that strongly argue against this. And then the type system is limited, as I said earlier. Um, so if you're coming from a language that has a richer type system, maybe this will annoy you. Same with boilerplate code. And what also is that the, there's no formal process yet for changes in the language, right? So if they decide to change something, then they change something else. You can't really uh, do anything against it, right? <laughs> so this brings us to GSGJS. And we also have uh, the creator uh, in the room. <laughs> so maybe one round of applause. Now it's time for the real deal, you know. Uh, why not just run Haskell in the browser if you have your backend written in Haskell? You know? um, so, uh, well, I'm not, I just put some example from this Reflex library here. Um, so basically, you can just use whatever Haskell library you like and run it in the browser, and it just works. So that's pretty cool. <coughs> um, 
Yeah, so the full has in the browser, it closely matches semantics in the execution model of GHC. Um, uh, it, it piggybacks on GHC actually for a lot of, lot of uh, work. Um, the development uh, is a little bit slower also than TypeScript. It's basically, uh, I don't know how many people are contributing currently, but it's mostly me, but mostly you. Uh, yeah, it's all the people who work on, uh, uh, on libraries, yeah, on the HSV. Really like So there's development moving, but it's not like Microsoft, uh, uh, where uh, a couple of employees are pushing forward the development. And the ecosystem is good. Uh, you can really use most of package packages that are there, and there are many uh, package packages there. And writing existing, um, uh, uh, writing existing JavaScript code is possible, and it, it works uh, pretty well. So, so you can uh, leverage the libraries that are already there. And it's used in commercial settings. <laughs> Right, so I decided now this time I'll, I'll um, give this, uh, uh, I'll evaluate this um, before uh, and, and also write one component in, in using GHCJS and see where it takes us. And I decided for this React Flux library that actually implements this React Flux pattern earlier uh, uh, with Haskell, right? So, the, the, and I started out just doing an example project that didn't have anything to do with, with, with the, with the um, with the actual commercial application, and I tried out what happens if I have a React application. I want to integrate third-party React application. What's with internationalization? How can I do code gamification? Can I draw something on a canvas? Can I do concurrency? Will this support Internet Explorer 9? <laughs> uh, I tried with Internet Explorer 8. I opened the debug console, and Internet Explorer 8 crashed. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened there, but so yeah. But and the, the final binary I got from this experiment was 1.1 megabyte, and if, if you zip it, zip it, then it gets small. So it's it's manageable, right? So I thought it would be cool <laughs> to have something like this, right? So I have the the, the tram cloud backend, so the backend software written fully in Haskell, compiled with GHC, and then I have these border libraries that are used by GHC and GHCJS. So all my utility functions are compiled into the backend and used natively, and can be used in my front end. And then I have an API that kind of like describes on type level uh, what the what the contract between backend and frontend is, and both just use this uh, this package to communicate with each other. So you have you have a lot of cool things now. You can actually reuse uh, code that is shared, and you have a type safe way of communicating with the backend, right? So there's a lot less things that can break. <laughs> so I went ahead and implemented our map. Uh, with, with GHCJS and with this, with this architecture in mind. Um, so here you can see uh, a network in France uh, that, uh, that has some, some uh, problems. And, um, and I did an evaluation, right? So I was very happy, happy, to, happy to write Haskell and I could reuse uh, uh, existing code, so that was really cool. Um, but uh, the problem was a little bit these high iteration times, right? So if you're doing backend development, uh, then maybe it's not so bad when some 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 compiles compile a little bit, right? Because you, but when you're doing front-end development, you kind of want to want to you know change UI elements, move things around, and, and have some quick reloading feature. And you just or you don't really get this here. So this is not really the fault of, of GHCJS here. It's just in general that GHC is is, is still uh, uh, slow. And also when I noticed that there's a performance penalty when you go back and forth between JavaScript and GHCJS, right? Because they don't represent uh, the, the data structures uh, uh, in the same way, right? So the Haskell data structures are not represented as uh, JavaScript data structures one, one to one. You have to do always have to do some conversion. And also, when you have a, a runtime error, that is probably even your fault because you messed up some FFI binding, and then it can be hard to debug because uh, you have lots of JavaScript and your debuggers then they don't like it when you open a big JavaScript file. Or at least that was my experience. And what I also found is that the Haskell type system does not optimally map to the JavaScript uh, objects, right? Because uh, you, you, want, you want something that has like anonymous records or missing row polymorphism because that's, or row polymorphism because that's uh, how uh, these, these JavaScript uh, functions or how you usually write JavaScript. Uh, you only operate on a, on a small portion of an object and you don't want to specify what the rest of the object looks like. <laughs> so the conclusion here is, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So I, I, I just put some things here, but actually that's what what I was really happy about, right? And so the the, the, the downsides I already um, basically mentioned them all. So um, and the editor support is not uh, not as great as you have 
with uh, Elm or Apache, right? but, but this can, of course, be good. So um, we didn't uh, go all in on, on GHG, unfortunately, and, and we looked at uh, the last name date for today, uh, PureScript, and um, PureScript also looks a little bit like Haskell. Um, so uh, this is an example of the new quick check in PureScript that was mentioned this morning. Um, and PureScript looks, uh, uh, it, it has a little difference from Haskell, right? So it has differences like it has row polymorphism. Um, and the goal here was actually also to generate human readable JavaScript, right? So that the JavaScript that they, they really make sure that they don't generate names for you. You have to name your things yourself. So you, for example, if you have type class instances, you have to name them that, that, so that the, 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 the generated JavaScript is, is readable. And actually, the development they have, they, the, they, was all, they, they started out also with one person, and now they have five to ten regular contributors, and they actually do frequent releases. So they are also moving quite fast. And they have a lot of uh, pure script packages that already exist, and it's easy to wrap uh, existing NPM packages, right? So they actually encourage that. Um, and that's, I think that's the, the, the right way to go. They, they also try to make sure that. The modules that are generated from PureScript actually integrate with the existing module loaders that you know, like Webpack or Verify, which, for example, Elm doesn't. And um, well, it's used also in, in commercial settings. And this is what we actually went with to, to implement uh, many of these nice uh, uh, views. And um, well, the third tell here is well, right. We reported the measurement view, and more art is in progress. We actually have just built on, a, on, a, uh, on an FFI on top of um, PureScript React, and we integrate these, the, uh, these cool uh, libraries to make uh, nice data visualizations, right? And it was really, really easy to pick up with Haskell knowledge, right? So if you don't have prior Haskell knowledge, uh, you have to uh, you, you're, you're diving into something that you that has a, a, a the learning curve is not as as pleasant as um, was touched for example. <laughs> And it has really nice editor support. I would even argue that it's better than Haskell's editor support at the moment. Um, uh, and it, it's a very productive language, right? Um, the, uh, the problems I, I noticed is that the syntax is a little bit more robust than Haskell. This is also uh, because you have to name out everything. And uh, maybe that's good. <laughs> um, but programmers are bad at naming, right? Um, so uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and they also have some missing features that you would really like when you come from Haskell, for example, that template Haskell, because you, I mean, if you want to use this concept of language uh, lenses there, then you have to write them by hand or have some preprocessor. And they also haven't uh, optimized for, for runtime performance uh, that much yet, right? So because all the functions are current, by default, uh, you always have this overhead of calling many functions when you want to do something. Um, so in conclusion, right, uh, it's, it has a lot of uh, advantages um, that we just talked to, and it also has. It also is still young, and, and they, they, they changed the language, uh, and, and there's no formal process for that. And the package management strategy is not yet solved all the way, right? They're still thinking about how to do this. Currently, they're relying on Power, but um, they're not uh, satisfied with that. So uh, it's not uh, quite there yet too, but uh, it, <laughs> in practice, it actually already works quite well. So in the end. What's the conclusion to all this? Um, I made this smiley matrix here. <laughs> that uh, on the, on the left-hand side, you kind of see uh, what, uh, where you're at. So for example, here on top, no FP key means that, you have, that your team you're developing in has never done any uh, functional programming. And you're working on a small project, then you're working on a big project, and then we have the team that actually did functional programming before and that uh, works on small <laughs> projects, right? So, uh, on the TypeScript line, I can say I can actually recommend, recommend it for all of these cases, right? The reason is just it's very mature. It's, it's being developed fast. It supports a lot of um, uh, uh, it, it supports the whole JavaScript ecosystem, and and, and I think it's it's here to stay, and 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 uh, it will um, it will make things with JavaScript a lot easier, right? Then, uh, if you look at Elm, I would say if you're not doing functional programming yet, but you're working on a small project, this is a great way to get started with functional programming, right? Because it's easy to pick up, and uh, you you really, really, uh, um, you really can you really can be productive. But you have to be aware. That's why I say it's only good for a small project that you will have to refactor some things as the language still changes, right? <laughs> um, 
And if you're coming from functional programming, I think you will kind of be stuck a little bit in here because you want uh, better type system or, or yeah. Um, and for GHGJS, I would say you can use it for all of them. It's not, uh, not always the optimal choice. In the case for the non-functional programming team, uh, you have to learn Haskell first, right? And, and uh, uh, this can be a step for, and, but it doesn't have to be. And if you're actually doing functional programming already, um, for smaller projects, I don't know if you, you want to deal with all, all the, 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 the uh, larger um, JavaScript binaries that you get out there, but if you actually do work on a big project that actually would be a lot of code if you had done it in JavaScript too, then the difference is not that big anymore. <laughs> and PureScript at the end, I would say, uh, well, if not that well suited for non-functional programmers for the same reason as that GHGJS isn't yet, um, and this is mainly due to the error messages, and if you're already doing functional programming, then I think this is uh, a great choice. Right. So that's basically it. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, and thank you for listening.